Hello everyone, it's Monday, so it's another episode of Off the Menu. I'm Vincent Franchini, your host, with an superannuated Charles Coulomb. Superannuated? You mean as an elderly? Yeah. Old? Past my prime? The big 6 you know? Yep. I... You're right. I'm up there. You... But you know what they say, 60 is the new 90. <laughs> I think about that a little bit. <laughs> At least that's how I feel these days. <laughs> it's nineties, the new six. I mean, isn't that how it's supposed to work? Like, are you okay? You seem very confused. Sixty is the new ninety. Because they say forty is the new thirty. No, 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 no. Forty is the new sixty. Forty is the new sixty. How does that work? Because it's twenty twenty. Twenty twenty. Yeah. Because of twenty twenty, sixty is the new forty. That's yeah. It's the new paradigm. It's the reset. <laughs> this is so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's the reset. It's the new realization. Oh, uh, the new normal. The new normal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. See, everything's got to hell in a handbasket, and you know why shouldn't we go with it? That's what I always say. <laughs> why stay out of the crowd? As the one lemming said to the other. <laughs> So what's new, Charles? How do you feel now that you're 60 years old? Well, I feel old. Uh, I also feel sort of entombed because we had another set of lockdown regulations. We're getting a new set uh, this coming week. As of Tuesday, we're going to have 24-hour curfew. Wow, that seems pretty excessive. Okay. Well, you could go to the market. You could go to work. Uh, you can run, but you can't play football. No team sports. Uh, it's only supposed to be through December 6th. I mean, in Los Angeles, we, the for the first time actually in my lifetime, we had a curfew, and that was during the, uh, the unrest, the riots over the summer. And that was like uh, they gave our curfew like 6 o'clock or something like that. Yeah. So you guys didn't do anything, and you've got a, a 24-hour curfew. Yeah, well, that's because of the COVID monster. Hmm. That must be the, really uh, bad The rates over there. of infection. What's that? It must be really bad over there. Well, the rates of infection have gone sky high, higher than they were in March. Uh, and the numbers in the hospitals are slowly creeping up. The death rate hasn't increased too much. Yeah, uh, in the United States... In the United States, uh, we are we're peaking as well. Uh, I think uh, the new cases have been as high as it ever has been, um, but the hospitalizations have only increased slightly. So to me, that suggests a lot more testing that is catching a lot of asymptomatic people. So. I don't know, but uh, I'm very hopeful be- with the news of uh, Pfizer's, um, what is it, vaccine or is it yeah. a drug? It's a vaccine, I think. Yeah. 90% uh, cure rate or something like that? Well, so far. And it's interesting because, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of vaccines work by basically they give you sort of a weakened version of the disease. Yeah. And your, and your body does antibodies. With this thing, what they do is they put in the RDA, not the DNA, and it tricks your. Uh, they don't actually put the fully formed thing into you. RNA. And it, oh, the, yeah, they put yeah. in the RNA, which attaches to your DNA, and tricks it into making antibodies. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah, sometimes it has to get complicated like that. Yeah, the one thing is you have to accept a barcode on your forehead and your wrist. Oh, well, that's not too big of a deal. No, no, but the 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 plus side is that you won't need a credit card anymore. Oh, you won't need a credit card. Just just the mark of the beast on your forehead. No, well, no, it's a barcode. Oh, barcode, barcode. Yeah, got it. No, we sorry, my 
Sometimes they get the linguistics wrong. No, no, no. It's a barcode. It has your. It has six six six, and then your uh, your uh, uh, social security number. Oh man. Um... What? And also, the, the, there's an implant so that they can check on your vaccination status at all times. Why? For purely medical reasons. Huh. Well, see, this way they'll know if you're already vaccinated, so you can get on a plane or, or a bus or into your car or whatever. Okay. They'll know you're not carrying the disease. Well, oh, that's nice. Isn't that convenient? That's very convenient. I love that. Yeah. There's just one thing. You're, um, if you try to enter a church, it'll short circuit and kill you. Huh. What, is that a glitch or something? Yeah, it's a glitch. Kind of like the uh, glitches during the election. They're trying to work on it. I'm sure they'll have it ironed out soon. <laughs> ah. Here we go. Oh, this is what reminded me of. I just found it. Uh, this reminds me of the Babylon B uh, news item. Democrats propose sending Republicans to unity camps because everyone's talking yeah. about the unity. <laughs> well, you heard what uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said. I try not to, but okay. No, AOC says that... Uh, lists the the addresses and so forth of trump supporters should be collated so they could be made to pay uh that was about actual employees not supporters wait no, oh oh, being... oh yeah you're uh, you're making a joke okay yeah to cope yeah i see what you're saying everyone's got to be punished in the name of freedom and love yeah there was a lot of that on uh, by the liberals where they're saying mark down these people because we're going to yeah. get them. Well, I mean, that's what doxing and canceling is all about. And this is the kind of thing that's going to lead to people being shot dead. And I don't mean, I don't mean the people being canceled or doxed will be shot dead. I mean, the cancelers and the doxers. We need we need a happy song for a dying planet, Charles. I don't want to hear about canceling, doxing, or shooting people. Okay, I don't either. So we want a happy song for a dying planet, do we? Yeah. Okay, I can do this. It shouldn't be this uh, hard. What's that? It shouldn't be this hard. No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Happy days are here again. The skies above are clear again. Let us sing a song of cheer again. Happy days are here again. All together, shout it now, there's no one can deny it now, and we'll tell the world about it now. Happy days are here again. There we Is go. Is that better? That's better. They're playing Christmas music on the radio, or at least my, my brother is playing it on the radio, or listening to it on the radio. Um, Christmas Christmas season is coming early this year. I think people need it to escape, you know, as uh, Auntie Mame uh, put it in the musical Mame, we need a little Christmas right this very minute. There's even more Christmas lights coming out this year, too. There, it's really, they're really jumping the gun on this, on this one. Well, I think it's, you know, people, it's been, I, I don't know if it's so much Christmas or New Year's they're keyed on. <laughs> I know. Let, let, you know, let's get the hell out of 2020. You know, I know. It's like getting out of Dodge. I say, load up the car. Let's pull out of this dump. Yeah. <laughs> oh. There's uh, there was a very funny uh, meme I uh, I put up on my own Facebook account that said uh, this is the uh, the fifth uh, what was it This is the fifth year of 20. Today marks the fifth year of 2020. <laughs> wow yeah it feels like it yeah it just goes on and on and on the year from hell well, the year we'll never forget I told my uh, I told my uh, classmates here uh, the kids that uh, uh, this is the stuff 
of which long and annoying stories told to children and grandchildren are made out of. <laughs> I said, just think, kids, you're going to be able to say, did I ever tell you about how back during a lockdown in 2020? Yes, yes, yes. But do you remember my, my, my neighbor across the hall and me, we used to, yes, Grandpa, I've, I've heard that story. I said, just think, kids, you're laying those deep foundations and roots now. Isn't that beautiful? It's nice. It's nice. Yeah, I thought so. I think the kids need to understand, you know, that their elders' garbage actually comes from similar situations to what they themselves will go through, or in this case, are going through. All the different funny things we have to do to make do right now we're going to remember them. I said, and of course you guys are going to be around a lot longer than I am. So you're going to be able to borrow, bore far more people with this stuff than I will. That's right. They seem to be happy about it in a sense, sort of in, in a way. Yeah. All right. Um, let us, well, we don't have any memes, so in lieu of memes, I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna put a picture up. Uh, so you asked several weeks ago uh, yeah. our viewers to post any celebrations uh, yes. for Charles, if it happens. So we've got one. One person sent it in from Twitter, Knight Errant. Enjoying some Casada Siciliana with friends for Charles's 60th birthday. Happy birthday, Charles. We wish you many more. Thank you so much. The uh, the San Fedisti in Brooklyn sent me a uh, a uh, wonderful video. They're singing me happy birthday at a party for me, which you know made me feel very good. I don't know if anybody else did that across the globe, but for all of you folks, and also for the many many uh, happy birthday messages I got mm. on on Twitter and on uh, on Facebook, thanks very very much. It it really helped. I got to tell you, the kids here really put on a good show for me uh in terms of my my birthday they um well they did several things uh we had pork cutlets of course from cafe Vess, and then uh they had invested in gin and uh vermouth and orange juice and uh, uh olives and onions and so forth so we had gibsons and martinis and so forth but i also introduced them to the cocktail that got my grandparents through prohibition the Bronx cocktail. Hmm. Uh, what is that? Orange, it's a third orange juice, a third gin, a sixth dry vermouth, and a sixth sweet vermouth. And strained through uh, strained through ice and poured into a martini glass. And I got to tell you, they liked it. They really did. And I thought it was wonderful that a cocktail over 100 years old and long after Prohibition could bring such Satisfaction to so many people so far away. Hmm. Gin and orange juice, that's a that's a strange mixture. It's it's quite good. And uh when when the uh when the meal and the cocktails were over, they showed my favorite film. Oh, yeah, the uh which which one? They might be giants. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they, uh, it was grand. It was really, really grand. And there are two versions, the long version and the short version. And they're not much different except that one key scene is cut out of the short version. So they did some research. They found online you've got the short version that's crystal clear and the longer version that's not as good. So what they did was they showed the short version up to the missing scene switched to the other one, showed the missing scene, then went back. Hmm. So a lot of ingenuity. And they, they, they really gave me a wonderful time. And uh, I, uh, I very much enjoyed it. We, you know, I gave a very uh, appropriately sentimental speech and uh, told them the truth, which is, you know, most of our viewers are young, and uh, as are they. And I told them, as I'll tell you all, um, from my vantage point of 60 years. I wish you all so much the best. 
you know, so much better than what my generation did and went through. You know, so, so many of my peers, their lives were shipwrecks. Um, and I, I pray, I pray that each and every one of you has a good and rich and fulfilling life in heaven at the end of it. Hmm. It, uh, and it is, it is sobering, you know. I do feel the cold wind on the back of my neck, cold breath. Um, 30 years ago was my 30th birthday party, which was a big blowout. And it went like that from then till now. Just like that. Uh, so I presume that however much time I've left, presuming that I die this side of 90, will go just as quickly. Quicker, in fact. Uh, the last decade, since my 50th, poof, the teens just zip by. So, uh, we'll see what happens with the uh, the 2020s, at the end of which I'll be 70 in 2030. Uh, 40, uh, and I won't be 40, I'll be 80 in 2040, if I live that long. And then 2050, I'll be 90. And if I live longer than that, I may be able to celebrate my brother's 100th in 2053. Hmm. But I don't think I'm going to make it that long. I certainly hope not. I mean, if things keep going in the direction that they're going all my life, I, I cringe, I shudder to think of what awaits me. Hmm. And, you know, an old friend of mine who's literally old, he's turning 89 this month. Uh, he went through all sorts of garbage in World War II and all that in Hungary with the Nazis and the communists and so forth. And he was complaining to me about the COVID shutdown and everything. And I said, well, you've been through worse. And he said, yeah, I've been through a lot worse, but I was much younger then. <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier to take this kind of thing when you're young. When you're old, it's really annoying. Yeah. So being sort of midway between him and you, I um, I understand both sides. Hmm. I have a question. We had such a long pre-show. We had an hour and 15 minute pre-show and it was we talked about a lot of really important and interesting things. It took us um, 30 minutes before we finally got to the questions themselves. Oh. So if you want to see that, sign up to become a, a patron today for $5 a month. Five big ones. Um, yeah, it was like its own episode. Um, it was really incredible. Uh, but... Uh, what you just said, for some reason, it. I'm remembering other, I don't know if it's you said this or other historians said this, but the reason World War I happened was because everyone, perhaps other than uh, uh, Franz Joseph, couldn't remember war. It had been yeah. so long for war. Other than Franz Joseph, right? He he saw the horrors. Yeah, oh, he war. remembered. Yeah, he remembered. But and that's why he was so anti-war, right? And everyone yeah. else. Uh, he told and, his ministers, he said, uh, if you had actually seen the face of battle as I have, you wouldn't be so quick to want to get into another one. Right. And to what extent are we in that? Obviously, it's different. It's like we're not going to get into World War Three. But in terms of not knowing some of the horrors of the world, we've had such an easy life in the United States in general. Yeah. You know what I mean? We've enjoyed yeah. peace in our country. To what extent is it coming after us? Is trouble coming after us? Because we just are alien to it right now. Well, that's a fair question. I mean, it's sort of like with our second civil war. Uh, in 1860, uh, 
with a few exceptions, nobody, I mean, the South had not faced a war since the first Civil War uh, in, 17, uh, in the 1770s, 17, early 1780s. People just didn't know what it was like and how horrible it was. And if they did, uh, they didn't really realize how much war had changed since the 1770s. I mean, it was brutal and nasty then, but they didn't have mini balls. They didn't have uh, Gatling guns. They didn't have all the improved ways of killing each other that had developed over the uh, four score and 20 years um, that uh, Lincoln spoke about. So similarly, for the Europeans at the beginning of World War I, Europe had not fought a major war since 1815. There had been some minor ones, and Franz Josef was present for one of those. Uh, and it's interesting that he commanded the Austrians against the French at the Battle of Magenta, Napoleon III commanding the French. Both of them, ever after, were horrified because they saw war up close and personal. Uh, it didn't keep Napoleon from getting into war with Germany and well, Prussia, the Franco-Prussian War, which was his downfall. But it cured him of the belief that war is a great and glorious adventure. Um, if the, if the uh, European general staffs and the political leadership in Europe had paid more attention to our second civil war, they would have seen things like trench warfare, aerial warfare, submarines, uh, Gatling guns. And then you simply add 50 more years of technology to that. Trench warfare. I mean, one of the, the siege of Petersburg was one of the most horrific things uh, in history. And it was the introduction of, of major trenches, as you would see later on the Western Front. And it was terrible. It was utterly horrific. So if they had looked at our Civil War, our Second Civil War, more closely, or at all, perhaps, it would have given them some guidance, shall we say, as to what they might expect. But they didn't expect it. They thought, and the and the civilians thought, that it was going to be a merry romp, you know, we'll all be home by Christmas, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's not what happened. Instead, the brightest and best of Europe were slaughtered for nothing. Did you see the movie 1917? No. I kept meaning to when I was home last, hmm. but um, kept missing uh, missing the times. Then I, I got back here. Yeah, I saw it. It's quite a cinematic feat, I must say. Um, I'd be very interested to hear your opinion. I think we all would, because um, that's obviously... Oh captures the horror of World War One and trench warfare. Yeah. It's pretty bad. Although, uh, in 1914, and even to a small degree in 1915, you have the Christmas truces, which are, were much, much annoyed the general staffs of the period, but they were kind of a tribute to the both the Christian and the human spirit. So those things, those those fables are true, huh? Well, not fables. They actually happened. I mean, they actually, yeah. No. Wow, that's that's uh, that's really special. Yeah. Of course, you know the the officers involved were all uh, all court martialed. Really. On both sides, yeah. Do you agree with that? No. No, I mean, I can see why they did it, but I uh, I don't agree with it. I mean, but the, the war was such a, a senseless waste in any case. Um, I mean, nobody thought it would turn out that way, and they were all wrong. Uh, the only heads of state that actually served at the front during that war were Blessed Emperor Karl, of course, of Austria-Hungary, who was at the front, risked his life on a number of occasions. King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy, 
uh, King Albert of the Belgians, and uh, then one future uh, monarch, uh, the Prince of Wales, who would later become Edward VIII, which, again, you know, he had his chauffeur killed in front of him. People don't understand why Edward VIII was, uh, and then Duke of Windsor, was so opposed to going to war with Germany again. Well, see, he'd actually been there. And as my late father, who was a tail gunner in World War II against the Japanese, used to say, there is no pacifist like a soldier. Hmm. Yeah, I guess what, what brought this to mind, this area, is I guess when we were talking on a pre-show, some of your friends were saying, bring it on. Yeah. You know, and that illustrated to me that we have to realize that we don't know the horrors of these things. No. no. We've had easy lives. We have. And I mean, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've heard John Voight's very impassioned call for resistance to what many people see as the, as the uh, rolling coup uh, against uh, President Trump. And they feel that massive cheating has deprived him of the presidency. And not just massive cheating, which would be bad enough by itself, but massive cheating on the part of, of an administration that would radically change the face of this country. Um, and so he calls for resistance to it. And it may well be that that's what is required. It may, I don't know. We'll see. But what I do know is that if it does come to that, it's nothing to be looked forward to. Because it would be horrible, bloody, nasty. And as my late father used to say, you win a war the way you win an earthquake. So we must hope and pray that our country's problems are resolved without recourse to violence and bloodshed. Okay, I have a sort of a dismal question uh, for you. So we kind of talked Happy about this on. Days are here again. We we've talked about this on the pre-show, uh, which is there's sort of speculation on how much fraud there was. I mean, I think we can all agree there's some fraud. No. Um, now. Some people speculate that Trump won by a landslide and there were millions of fraudulent votes. I don't know if that's true. But if that it was true, how could we hope to win an election ever again? Well, see, this is, this is the problem. This is precisely the problem. Because if it is true, and if, in essence, you have a small-ish minority of the country running the show, then the system will not work. I don't know how you would have that happen without... something unpleasant but you know there's a reason the, the church has a teaching about just revolts and there are several things that have to be met for it to be just one is the faith has to be endangered first and foremost second uh, there has to be a reasonable expectation of victory not an absolute Assurance, because you can never have that. But a, a, an idea that, yeah, we'll probably win. There's a good chance. But thirdly, and this is the killer, doing nothing has to be worse than revolting. That's very important. Doing nothing has to be worse than revolting. And so you've got to think very, very carefully about what revolting would mean. Uh, I fear that this is what's going to happen. I fear that the people who, in all likelihood, will be taking power will continue where the Obama administration left off, and they will push and push and push with their Antifa and BLM allies. And sooner or later, there'll be a big blowback. 
that blowback will be horrific. Because what the people in charge don't realize is that the people they're annoying have they're better armed, better at organizing. And at the end of the day, truer believers in their cause than our lords and masters are in theirs. This is probably uh, because of biased media reporting, but why would you say uh, that they're better organized? Well, you look at the BLMs. These are not well-organized people. They're organized, which means they're better off than you know people in the suburban areas that they uh, that they terrorized. But once you get out of that part of the world, rural people tend to know each other. They tend to uh, stick together. I mean, look at the difference. For instance, when uh, Texas was hit and New Orleans were hit in 2005 by two major hurricanes world of difference in new orleans in the, in the uh, sugar bowl it degenerated into chaos because there's no in there there was absolutely no societal structure or framework it was every man for himself which it had, had been before you know before the hurricane hit it's just that all this stuff tends to come out when you've got unpleasantries in texas i think it was hurricane wilma or something totally different Neighbors were helping one another. They pulled together outside of Houston. Uh, they, they got each other's back. In a way that people used to do in urban neighborhoods also once upon a time. They don't know more. But, you know, it was almost a uh, stereotype of my youth. The old guy talked about, yeah, you know, back in the neighborhood, the old neighborhood, everybody looked after each other. You know, we didn't lock our doors. And it just goes, yeah, okay, Grandpa. And everybody loved each other. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, but there's a certain amount of truth to it in that urban neighborhoods in those days had the same kind of social cohesion that the countryside tends to. So, um, and small towns and so forth. So, uh, you, t- you, you show, well, I, I mean, to me, the epitome were three different uh, incidents during the, the long, hot summer of 2020 uh, when the, uh, the would-be looters who had just uh, burned down downtown Spokane set off for Kirtle Lane in a bus and several cars, and they were met not by the cops, but by a bunch of armed locals you know, who drew their guns on them and said, you better get in that bus or you're dead mate. And they turned the little rear ends around and went back to Spokane. Uh, similarly, wonderful video showed the uh, the Crips. It showed them uh, chasing the uh, the Antifas out of uh, Long Beach. That gives me hope for the world. Yeah, and, and yeah, the same thing in Chicago's little village when the the Latin Kings joined up with the cops to. And this is you know this is a street gang, you know, a lot of criminals. But they joined up with the cops to drive the looters out of the neighborhood. I'm not 100% sold on, on the better organized, though, because how do rural areas revolt against urban areas? They're going to drive to the city? No. What they do is they stop producing, and they, uh, they interfere with communications. They cut, uh, they cut wires. That kind of they thing. cut wires. Yeah. Well, they blow up uh, or they they pull down uh, they pull down uh, towers. Wow, my imagination isn't that okay. Um... And the other thing you have to bear in mind too is that a lot of the deplorables have served in the armed forces, and of course, a lot of the ranks of both law enforcement. And the in combat arms in the armed forces are recruited from the deplorables. Well, yeah, I mean, so I mean, if you could imagine, uh, if you could imagine, say, 
some suburb in Minneapolis or Milwaukee, which is a better example, uh, annoying the uh, annoying the governor and his sending in the uh, maybe not the Milwaukee police, but sending in the uh, the sheriffs or the uh, Wisconsin National Guard. Uh, how likely would they be to shoot on their own people? We're ending up in the same area of the pre-show because, again, that makes me think of the Braveheart scene with the Irish and the Scottish where they're charging each other and and right as they're about to clash, they all just hug and, and handshake. Um, well. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I can see where our minds are continually my, going. None of this is pleasant. You know, I hope that when I'm 70, we can laugh at how stupid I was when I was 60. Yeah. And how none of this came to pass. Okay. Well, shall we get to the questions? I think so. All right. Uh, three questions from Theo. Okay, Theo. Could you provide a sketch, if you will, of the Edwardian Garden Party of the end of the century, Bell Epic, Europe, before the First World War? <sighs> provide a sketch? Well... You know, this was a period when you still had the uh, the last gasp, if you will, of the Ancien Régime. Uh, this was a time when uh, the old and the new were side by side. You know, the, the, the monarchies and the nobilities were there, but so was industry and so were cars. Um, the church was still very, very important in life. But Socialism, communism, all these things were gaining strength. It was, I mean, basically, it was a weird mix of the old and the new. Uh, it produced some of the most extraordinarily beautiful kinds of artwork. You know, Art Nouveau and uh, the Arts and Crafts Movement. Uh, <clears throat> symbolism, Expressionism, Impressionism. Uh, the uh, some of the most incredible literature of our time was also produced. This is when Oscar Wilde was writing. Uh, when uh, when you had uh, people like Paul Bourget writing, and, and uh, just in America, it was a very formative time in terms of when a lot of our traditions, from Halloween and Thanksgiving to the American way of Christmas. All these things were developed. Um, it was, uh, in in retrospect, and of course it's all in retrospect, because, uh, you know, there there was a sort of, as they called it, the cult of the fantasy, the end of the century. The idea that uh, one age was ending and another beginning. And that was written and spoken a lot about. Uh, so much so that uh, Wilde got very annoyed at one point and said, fantasy ache, fantasy ache, if only it were found your mond, which means end of the century, end of the century, if only it was the end of the world. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, it was, uh, of course, against all that brilliance, you know, in the 11-course meals and so forth, you had terrible conditions in the factories. You had an urban proletariat that was in very bad shape and ripe for socialism. Uh, but at the same time, agriculture was still very strong. You know, and the squire, the squire, the 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 uh, farmer still pulled his cap to the squire as he rode by. So it was a um, time of transition. Uh, somebody sent in a question asking me about a poem, which I mentioned earlier. I'll say it again because it kind of fits. Oh, let us love our occupations. Bless the squire and his relations. To live upon our daily rations and always know our proper stations. Who wrote that? Oh, it was, a, I, I think, Annie. Hmm. You know, you know Annie. The musical? No, no, Annie Nominus. Uh, yeah. She wrote a lot of stuff. Okay. 
And she lived a long time, too, because, I mean, I've, I've, I've read stuff by her that goes all the way back to the Middle Ages. And she's still turning out stuff. It's something, you know, for a chick to last that long and still be on top of things today. Hmm. It's a miracle. All right. Uh, Theo also asks, what is your favorite pipe tobacco for warming these lengthening autumn evenings? Oh, Theo. I'll tell you, but everyone out there, feel free to send me my the pipe tobaccos I'm going to mention. Just send it to Charles A. Coulomb, Schloss Trumau, 21 Schlossgasse, 2521 Trumau, Austria. Just you send that pipe tobacco in. I'll, I'll smoke it. Don't you fret. Uh, I would say I like Cherry Cavendish. I like Balkan Sobrani, though I haven't had it in years and years. I like uh, Prince Albert. Borka Marif, especially rum flavored. Um, Latakia, I like. I really like Perique, which is a Louisiana tobacco. It's very hard to get. The late lamented um, tinderbox in Santa Monica always had Perique for me. And now they're gone, so. <sighs> anyway, now you know. Feel free to send it in. Again, that's Charles A. Coulomb, Schloss Trumau, 21 Schlossgasse, 2521 Trumau, Austria. You'll get nothing in return but my thanks. All right. Uh, Theo's last question. Honoré de Balzac said, quote, when the revolution cut off the head of Louis the Sixteenth, it cut off the heads of all the fathers in the country, end quote. Please discuss. Well, it's very true. I mean, what can I say? Uh, it's certainly, it's exactly what happened. The king was the father of France, the way every king is the father of his country. Uh get rid of him and fatherhood as a whole suffers you know there are three masculine roles king father and priest each one partakes of the other two and they're sort of interdependent so the king is of course king he's the ruler and so on but he partakes the fatherhood because he's father of his country father of his people he also partakes to a degree of the priesthood, partly because of the coronation and all that. Sometimes he actually had ritual roles. But beyond that, he's the chief layman of the nation. The priest partakes of kingship, particularly in the confessional uh, and in the guidance he has to give. And he also, of course, partakes of fatherhood. That's why we call him father, because he's also supposed to be the father of his people. Uh, and then the, the, the father is king in his household, in the sense that he rules it. But he's also priest in the sense that he should set the religious tone and you know, bless his children on New Year's and lead the family in grace and uh, do all the different house blessings that... Uh, the uh, ceremonies of the liturgical year require, you know, the blessing of the crash and the Christmas tree, or the uh, the uh, Easter baskets and things like that. So, an assault on any one of these three is an assault on all of them. I had a new thought this week, which is that all Catholics are actually unbeknownst to them, two-third monarchist. Okay. Therefore, monarchy in the church. Yeah. Therefore, they rule their family like a monarchy. They, You ain't getting your kids to vote. There is no democracy in the family. Sorry. No. There shouldn't be, anyway. It's only in the state that they have, there's all this weird stuff. In the other in the other roles, if we had democracy in the church, we would have had women priests by now, and probably Cardinal McCarrick would be the president or something. 
I mean, yeah, the you know, president of the church. You know, I mean, we would it would be a sewer. Um, even even more than it is. And but see, the church, despite all the problems, it's better off because of its uh, structure. Yeah. And the family is better off because of its structure. I mean, if it adheres to, for each family that adheres to that type of structure, none of this crap where it's like, oh, I'm not going to influence my children. Uh, I'm not going to impose my beliefs on them. No, no. I mean, my belief that the child should not run out in front of a car, mm. I don't want to limit his freedom of action. Mm. Great point. And of course, if the kid does get hit, imagine how I'll cash it. So, what do you think about that, though? I mean, uh, to me, well, I was I was contemplating that if that's sort of a persuasive tool. Well, I, I think so because I mean, the truth of the matter is, especially for Catholic Americans, uh, we always separate our political life from our religious and personal life. Have you noticed that? Yeah. We always, well, of course, that's true at home and at church, but not in the public square. Yeah. Well, why not? Well, because the Declaration, because the Constitution, because because what? And, of course, true, too, no one is democratic when it comes to anything that's really important to them. Hmm. I mean... Would you want investment? Would you get investment advice from a consensus of your friends? Hmm. Would you want to talk to a bunch of your pals about medical advice? You know, guys, I've got like this lump on my back. What do you all think it is? <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting watching all these anti monarchist, uh, prominent Catholic uh, figures. Talking about all hail Christ, King of Kings. Well, which... I'm I'm this I was this close to saying you mean all hail Christ, President of Presidents, because monarchy That's bad. Not... Wait, you watch yourself. Monarchy way bad. You watch yourself. You can't be saying that. No, not King of Kings, Lord of Lords. No, no, no. We don't. We uh, in the immortal words of Madeleine Albright. We don't do cakes. <laughs> that, that great Catholic oh. theologian, Madeleine Albright. You loved. You had a thing for these nasty political women. Um, uh, excuse me, calling them skanks is not nice. Who's the other one in the Clinton? Um, there were three. There was her. There was Donna Shalala, and there was Janet Reno. Janet Reno. Oh, Janet Reno. That's the one I was thinking of. Well, you, you remember the joke as to why the three of them, the three weird sisters, were in the cabinet. What? Oh, well, so that Clinton wasn't tempted? There'd be well, absolutely the no shenanigans? Ones. They were the only women in Washington that even he wouldn't touch. <laughs> I believe it. Next to his wife, of course. Poor Hillary. Yeah, well, at least she's living in Chappaqua. That's more than a lot of us can say. Hmm. I like Chappaqua. I, I know. do. Yeah, good. That's I grew fine. up near there. My, my aunt lived there. That's fine. So I'm supposed to say something bad against Chappaqua now? No. I played uh, uh, at the house that uh, Hillary Clinton is now living in. Are you serious? Wait, okay, map that out for us. Well, it's not hard. We lived in Mount Kisco. My Aunt Jenny lived in Chappaqua. We knew the people who lived there before uh, in that house long before the Clintons. They're super rich people or what? Yeah. But everybody in Chappaqua had money. It's just the sort of thing, you know. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with living outside Chappaqua. It's like not living in Beverly Hills. Some some people manage. I, I I mean, no, it's true. There are many people in the Los Angeles area who don't live in either Beverly Hills, San Marino, or Hancock Park. And there's nothing wrong with them. They're perfectly delightful people. Well, perhaps not delightful, but certainly 
salt of the earth, I guess you would say. It's like your wasp version of Chad. Uh, well, uh, I suppose you could say that if you wanted to, if you were unkind. But you see, the thing you've got to understand about places like Chappaqua is that they're, they appeal to the aesthete in each of us. I mean to say that, take for example, if you will, and I'm, I'm only bringing this up as an example, the Sleepy Hollow Country Club, not too far from there. Lovely place. Now, how many people do you know are actually connoisseurs of country clubs? Not too many, I'd wager. They wouldn't be comfortable in those sorts of surroundings. You know that yourself. They, they, they wouldn't try it. It's true. So you see. No, 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 no. Chappaqua was a lovely, lovely place. I remember it fondly. I was just there in January, actually. And I was in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is uh, another lovely place. I have relatives there, you know. Okay. Thank you. Well, I just thought I'd point it out. Hey, a question Prominently. <laughs> prominently. Very prominently. <laughs> did, I, did I mention? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, you did. You, you already said it. So I, I talked about San Marino. Yes. Yes. Uh, Hancock Park. All right. Question from Aaron. Dear Mr. Coulomb, in grudgingly respectful sup to the dutiful Don. Ooh, sup. Sup. What it is, my man. What it is. <laughs> in previous episodes, you've made mention of the kingfish himself, Huey Long, but never in great detail. This is something of a frightful omission, given that Governor Long, in my humble opinion, was and still is America's foremost theorist on practical politics. He understood America, dem American democracy at its fundamental level, and this is proven no more powerfully than with the following quote. Those of you who come in with me now will receive a big piece of the pie. Those of you who delay and commit yourselves later will receive a smaller piece of pie. Those of you who don't come in at all will receive good government. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so would Mr. Coulomb describe in his modern-day troubadour way the rise and fall of Huey Long? Uh, Huey Long, the Bonaparte of the bayous. He, uh, this was a man who understood politics, the practical side. He understood that nobody doesn't do anything unless there's something in it for him. And he also understood that politics has to be, has to be financed. You see, you don't get politics out of nothing. <laughs> well, he started out in Wind Parish, North Louisiana. Now, the thing about Huey Long was that he did not, he was not what you would call really an ideological man. He was very much dedicated to becoming the head of Louisiana and senator, and then finally he wanted to be president of these United States. So he uh, ran for governor uh, after building up a machine in North Louisiana, and he was elected. Well, I'm here to tell you. That man did everything you could imagine. On the one hand, he expanded state government. Now, you got to understand, in them days, the state of Louisiana did not have what you would call a very intrusive government. There were a lot of places where you didn't even have roads. So he put through a big public building program. He built highways. He built hospitals. He completely rebuilt and made a new uh, Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. He did everything you could imagine in terms of infrastructure. But see, this all required employing people. And there, there was the trick, because if you wanted to get employed on a project, well, you got to have to contribute something. And so in every government office, they had what was called the deduct box. And so 
your salary. The salaries of all the government people were huge. They were really raised up high. But a portion of that you had to kick back through the deduct box. You had to put that, put, put a little bit back, you know. Because you were getting more than you were getting before, so it wasn't a problem. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So, anyhow, you along, he he soon had Louisiana completely under his thumb, and the Louisiana National Guard was his private army. Now, everybody can hate me for my really bad southern accent. I'm just putting you on, on warn right now that it, it really stinks to high heaven, but it doesn't bother me a bit. I don't care what people think. Like Huey Long, he didn't care either. He had these bizarre colored pajamas. Everybody knew about it. Everybody thought it was terribly funny. He thought it was funny. It was all part of, he was a bit clownish. You know, he wore always dressed to the nines. His incredible suits, but the ties, tell you what, them things would blind you. And he knew it too. It was all part of the show, part of the act. He was very flamboyant and people loved it. They loved it so much that from his being governor, they sent him to Washington as senator. And the thing was, you didn't get nowhere else in Louisiana without Governor Long saying he was okay. Well, he came up with a national movement, the Share Our Wealth Movement. Every man a king, but no one wears a crown. Uh, and that was, was going to do a little history, but not everything. Billionaires was going to hold on to a good chunk of their money. He said, you know, you got more than four or five million. No, you should be willing to share the rest. Who needs more than four or five million? And as you can imagine, there are a lot of people like the sound of that. Well, he went to the Senate in Washington, and he cut a real, real figure, I can tell you. He was truly the only politician in Depression-era America that FDR was frightened of. Yep. And he annoyed the old party machine, the regulars in New Orleans. Really annoyed them. Well, one day, in 1935, he was assassinated by a man named Weiss, who was a dentist, whose father, uh, Huey, had uh, really done in. Soon as Huey was dead, Oh, by the way, he also built a new state capitol building, which is the one they're, they're in now. So as soon as he was dead, they built this huge tomb for him with a big statue of Huey on a tower. It's still there. It looks like, you know, a, a stand, monument to some Latin American dictator. It's amazing. Well, the U.S. government went down there as soon as Huey was cold. And they told the Long family, headed now by his younger brother Earl, that if they wanted their machine to last and didn't want everybody to go to jail for all of the, you know, corruption and so on, they had to cut off, cut loose the Shara Wealth Clubs outside Louisiana. So they did. And the long machine continued to run Louisiana for another decade or two. But a man named Gerald L. K. Smith, who was in charge of the Shara Wealth Clubs, he lined up with Father Coughlin, up there in Detroit, and Dr. Townsend out in California. And they put together the National Union Party. And they tried to run against uh, FDR in 1936. Did not fare very well. And that was the end of longism as a national force. Hmm. Do you think he had any lasting effect in Louisiana, sure. People t tell you stories to this day about the deduct box, I can tell you that. <laughs> and, of course, the things he built are still there. I mean, just like all the stuff the New Deal built are all over the place. So, too, with uh, Long's things in, in Louisiana, they're still very much there. In terms of ideology, not so much. But I'm willing to wager... That if what I fear comes to pass in terms of a civil war, and we get a strong man who brings us out of it, to a greater or lesser degree, he'll be indebted to the memory and the tactics of Huey Long. What was the difference between FDR and 
Huey Long politically? Um, because to me, it's hard to differentiate given how politics are now, where you yeah. have the Republicans, Democrats, and there's this giant gaping chasm between the two parties. What what was the difference between Huey Long and FDR? Well, Huey was a bit more for redistribution than FDR was. But other than that, they were actually similar in a lot of ways. Uh, it's just that FDR was much more a member of the establishment than Long was. Uh, although something of a rebel within that establishment. Uh, and he was a lot smoother. You know, some people believe that Roosevelt was partly behind Long's assassination. I don't know if that's true, but I wouldn't be surprised because, as I say, he he had so much of FDR's program only taken further. You see, more radical. He was uh, Roosevelt was a very flamboyant speaker, a very flamboyant figure. And, but Long was more flamboyant still. That's true. Wow. So that's very similar. I mean, out of all the domestic policy, it's just a little bit more redistribution. Pretty much, yeah. And, see, that's why so many people like Father Coughlin had backed Roosevelt his first time. Hmm. Uh, but he didn't feel Roosevelt went far enough. So, oh, you know what? They're the, they were the same party, weren't they? Uh, or Long what? and Roosevelt, yeah. Well, I guess I guess what I'm confused is. So is this this was before FDR was president? No, no, this was uh, after his first term. So uh, the election of '36 was his second election, his oh, re-election. So Huey Long was so strong that he would challenge within his own party an incumbent president yeah and fdr i, I i've never heard of such a thing in the past oh, it, years. it happened in fact we had a president uh, back in the 1880s chester allen arthur republican sitting president he lost the nomination hmm. okay to who to um i mean, would ask who did he lose it to Harrison? McKinley, I think, but I could be McKinley? wrong. McKinley? McKinley was just before the turn of the century. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I could be wrong. Anyway, uh, Arthur lost it, which was, you know, at the time, everybody was quite excited, as you can imagine. Wow. Okay. Wow. All right. Uh, question from Matthew. Hello, Charles and Vincent. I've been thinking a lot about the holy sacrifice we offer God in the Mass. It seems to me that fundamentally, this really is the ultimate difference between Catholics and Protestants. It seems that the essential heresy of Protestantism is not sola scriptura or anything like that, but in valid worship, because they don't come to God through the sacrifice of the Eucharist. Yes, many Protestants believe in the body and blood of Jesus in the Eucharist, but so far as I'm aware, the Catholic point that the Eucharist is a sacrifice has always been strongly rejected by Protestantism on all sides. Without sacrifice, we cannot properly worship God. It appears to me that no matter how much Catholics love and venerate Mary, even going Saint, uh, even going full St. Louis de Montfort with her, we can never really worship her simply because we don't ever offer her the sacrifice of the Mass. So, the thing is that uh, he's touched on two important points. Uh, one is uh, that Gerard Tolkien made that point about um, the Reformation really being against the Mass rather than sola scriptura. Uh, that's on the one side. On the other, um, our friend Bill Zook, whom you'll recall, yeah. made the point that Catholic veneration of Mary is very much like Protestants' non-sacramental worship of Christ. Hmm. 
And that's why he said to me, and it was quite a surprise when he said this to me. He said, you know, when they accuse us of worshiping Mary, they're not lying. Um, because what they do toward Christ is like what we do toward Mary, since they don't have the sacrifice. They don't have the sacraments. Um, so, yeah. I, I think I think it's he's made a very very good point. Yeah, Bill Zook was a Protestant convert, so he knew. Yeah, what was going on? Yeah, he sure he sure did. And I mean, I'll never forget the way he broke that thing on me. He said, uh, "Well, you know, when they accuse us of worshiping Mary, they're right." And I was like, "What?" Because every Catholic knows you don't worship Mary. In that yeah, sense. yeah. But and I, I, Bill being Bill, you know, he sort of he kind of said it for effect, but. His point was quite well taken, I think. Yeah. Uh, Matthew continues, um, I'd also suggest that Protestantism is really Gnosticism in that its fundamental point is that the Catholic Church is not the true church. It seems this is the only thing Protestants have always agreed with each other about. Perhaps the lack of proper objectivity in Protestantism, no sacrifice, and the need to reject the fully objective authority of the church means that Protestantism can only really be something that exists in the mind and not in objective reality. Can Charles comment on any of this? And if so, would he please do so? Well, the guy has got me dead to rights. He knows what I would normally say. So, yeah. yeah, I can comment about it. What's the next question? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I've touched on part of it already, but uh, I would agree with him, uh, especially because it's why... Protestantism is ahistorical. They they shut away from history because um, if you look at the historical element of things, the pretext for which Protestantism emerged cannot be true if Christ told the truth. Otherwise, I mean, if he did, the gates of hell will never prevail against his church. And if the Protestants are right, it did. They did. So to avoid that conundrum, it all becomes ahistorical. And there, you know, if you bring up historical issues, their answer is like, well, I love Christ. And that's it. You know, well, I, I stick to the Bible. So uh, in that sense, I suppose you could say it's sort of kind of Gnostic in a way. Hmm. It's interesting. I think what you and I have said on the show many times that liberalism or liberals are ahistorical, but we've yeah. never said before that Protestants are ahistorical. It's interesting because I think in our case, one begets the other. Yeah, Protestantism begat liberalism. Yeah. And liberalism, to put it another way, is Protestant Christianity in decay. Yeah, there it is. It takes, it takes the implicits that were there and runs with them. Now, mind you, uh, I doubt very much that Luther or Calvin would have appreciated the French Revolution. You know, and I doubt very much that they would appreciate today's secular world at all. Nevertheless, it springs from the ideas implicit in what they pushed. Hmm. Fortunately, most originators of new ideas never live long enough to see what they turn into. Yep. Question from Zarello. Okay. How, do, how do we define traditionalism? That's a very good question because it's like conservatism. It's sort of a moving target, you know. Uh, what is the tradition? So, for instance, you have... Uh, I know of three different ways to define it. Okay. You you could call traditionalists people who hold to a, a given way, a received way of doing things. So we talk about Catholic traditionalists, Orthodox traditionalists, um, Boy Scout traditionalists. In other words, people who stick to the received thing and resent any attempt to change it. So that's one kind of traditionalism. Uh, there's also a sort of philosophy called traditionalism, which basically rejects reason in favor of received things like language. 
um, and and really, I, I know that sounds odd, but they would say basically that in our language, in folklore, in all this stuff that we've received, that's where true wisdom is to be found, not in any kind of abstract reasoning. Hmm. Then there's a third kind of traditionalism, uh, also called perennialism, that was made popular by people like René Guénon and so on. And that holds that there is a sort of primeval tradition at the bottom of all faiths and religions, and that it's purer in some than others. Uh, but that the value of any given religion is the degree to which it retains more or less of this primeval tradition. Gaynor decided, although he was uh, born and raised Catholic, he decided that it was Islam that best held that tradition, which is one reason why I've got no use for Gaynor. <laughs> and it always makes me giggle when people call me a perennialist or a, uh, or a uh, traditionalist in that sense. And they do sometimes. I get called all kinds of things by all kinds of people. And when they do... My response is always, if they're rational and not the kind who are just throwing big words around they don't know to be insulting. Um, there are enough people like that in the world, believe me. I tell them, well, the problem is again on the gang, you looked, at, looked through the telescope on the wrong, the wrong end. The truth is that Catholicism embodies all the primeval truths, and other faiths have value or not to the degree that they resemble it. Hmm. Um, but anyway, there you go. So uh, those those are all very, very different things. Hmm. Uh, in America, you would you could call a constitutionalist a uh, a traditionalist in terms of government, uh, whereas in Canada, you would save that term for a red Tory. Hmm. So you see, like conservatism, it's very elastic. I see. That isn't to say it doesn't have any value. It's just that when you use it, you really need to be clear as to what you're using it about and make sure whoever you're speaking to or writing for, you make that, that clear. I see. Yeah. For me personally, I regard uh, a person to be traditionalist if they have an openness to any. Any encyclical or writing or council before Vatican II, because to me that shows they're abiding by the full tradition of the Church. You know, it's not just everything that came from Vatican II, or that emanated out of Vatican II. Well, I mean, there's the whole shelf life thing. I mean, as soon as someone tells you to justify a change that's the opposite of what had been done before or said before, and says, oh, well, the magisterium has moved on since then. Well, no, the magisterium can't move on. Yeah, see, that, that's a good example. See, like, if I cite something, like the syllabus of errors, or something, you know, some encyclical by Pius X or something, and that is an actual hurdle for the other person in the argument or debate, then that's a traditionalist because they recognize, okay, this carries weight. This isn't simply simply something that is antiquated and can be discarded. Well, yeah. I, it's it's that's what uh, the late uh, Tom Zola used to call shelf life theology. Mm. You know, if 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 a document hasn't been quoted uh, recently, yeah, by someone, then it loses all validity. Yeah. And, you know, truth be told, even in some of the, I wish a lot of uh, even uh, prelates that have good reputations nowadays, that they would quote things before Vatican II more. But well, they don't at all. And I've read their books, too. We sell their books. And it's, I don't know. It's as though the church only came into being uh, in 1968. I don't know if they're getting bullied uh, or if they I'm really... Sure. Because the things that they quote, too, aren't worded well. 
like well, see, part of it's bullying, and I think part of it's a question of education. Because remember, a lot of these guys grew up after the council. Yeah, of course. And seminaries didn't teach pre-conciliar stuff. Or if they did, it was simply to show how wonderful the council was. That's got to be it. That's how I've I've had to um, charitably handle some bad local priests who call Adam and Eve... You know, uh, just a, a a story. You know, not no, not real happen. Just... I I tell myself, well, they were formed that way. Well, they, they were. Yeah. And and they're right. It's just a story. Just like the uh, necessity of supporting the church financially is actually a parable for being open hearted or being for being open hearted. It's not literally about giving the church money. It's just about generally being a nice person. Mm. So it's not like you actually have to put anything in the collection plate or pledge anything. You just have to be, generally speaking, nice to people. That's good to know. That saved yeah. me a lot of money. Oh sure. Like if you if you give a buck to a uh, to a guy on the street, you don't have to give any money to the church that that Sunday. Nice. All right. Uh... Brian has a very good question. He says, Charles, if detachment from even venial sin is required to, gla- to gain a plenary indulgence, who is able to obtain one other than a saint? Well, that's why you've got to pay close attention to what you're doing when you do the prayer or the action that gains the indulgence. Can't let your mind wander, especially not down sinful avenues. So you're saying an attachment is during the execution of the, of the uh, act. act. Yeah. yeah. To me, the the way uh, what I was taught was that um, it, it's you're you're not realistically getting a plenary. That it's going to be partial to the extent that you're detached from venial sin. Because that's always the caveat, I thought. He says, you know, if you don't have full detachment, then it's partial. Well, see, again, I think part of that is, in a sense, a tactic to keep us from being, um, what's the word I want, complacent. You know, uh, it's very easy to fall into the thing, well, as long as I just go through the motions, I got it. And they never want that. It's like when you when you read the fine print about scapulars or say Benedict medals or whatever, the graces are always dependent on your doing the right things, you know, on on, on being chased, on doing this, on doing that. None of this stuff is ever get out of jail free card without you having to do something. Well, I I don't believe that it's a get out of jail free card at all unless you're you're there. Unless you're like a sainthood. Like to me, well, here's the thing. If you aren't a saint, why should you get a plenary indulgence? Why should you? Because that that doesn't seem like that's justice. Like because purgation is you're getting closer and closer to God. But if you're not a saint, then you're not there yet. So you have to spend some time, right? Yeah, but you see what the indulgences do is they remit some of the time in purgatory. Remember how that time purgatory gets adduced. Every sin we commit, there's a certain amount of uh, punishment in purgatory rocked up for it. Yeah. But you can work that off here, either by offering it up during pains or whatever, or by getting indulgences. Um, When you get a plenary indulgence, all that does, presuming that you've done everything required and while doing it, not been attached to uh, venial sin. All it does is get rid of all the punishment you've racked up thus far. It, it doesn't do anything I mean, for the future. But, I mean, you get that just for publicly saying a rosary. Yeah, there are a lot of things you can get it for. It, it doesn't seem... Hard enough? Right. Right. To which my answer is that's why Christ gave the power of binding and loosing to the church. 
And it's interesting that easy as it as it's become, and it's become progressively easier to get these things. Most of us are still so hard hearted we won't even try. That's a huge irony, isn't it? I mean, the Protestant revol- uh, revolt happened. You know, one of the the justifications of it is what the selling of indulgences. Who would even yeah. pay money for an indulgence now? They're giving it away no, for free, and no one's even taking it. No, that's uh, why the Babylon Bee did that article where uh, what Pope Francis is like doing an info uh, infomercial. He's selling indulgences free. You know, a special no. deal. Um, but see, see, they sell annulments now, not indulgences. I don't know. I, I mean, I guess you're right. I guess it, it's to keep um, that you. I don't know. To me, I guess for myself, I have to. I believe it's partial because I want to keep doing it. You know, I I don't want to just do a public rosary like, well, okay. I'm I'm set. Well, Going to go straight see, to heaven not. if I die right now. But see, you're not. Well, if you died right now. But it's just like when you come out of the confessional, you're in a state of justification. How long is that going to last? Yeah, but, I mean, just one or two sins compared to, I mean, you just wiped away a lifetime of sins, you know, well, compared to just so a, lot a couple of days. Off. Yeah. You're a lot better off than you would have been. But the point I'm making is, you're going to start sitting again almost immediately. Oh, yeah. You'll be racking that stuff up again. Don't you worry about that, son. All them pool, all them balls may go off the pool table right now, but they're going to be racked up. They're going to be racked up for you. Don't you worry. I don't know. To me, to me, I guess just for myself, I have to have a, help, a healthy skepticism of whether I get the full plenary. Um I mean, I do it, and I, I want as much of the remission as I can get, but I guess I'll just leave the actual determining to God. That's always wise in this kind of thing. Yeah. No, I want to run the process myself. <laughs> if it was uh, up to him, I might go to hell. But if I run the show, I know what's going to happen. Okay, last question for today is from Anita, who is a All new right. patron. Right. Welcome aboard, Anita. Good to have you. Um, is there a realistic possibility that the monarchies of France, Italy, Germany, Russia, or China could be restored? Oof. Well, each of those are different cases, of course, the different problems. But sure, yeah, there's always a possibility. <laughs> I couldn't tell you how or when. Uh, certainly each of those countries uh, have people who believe in their monarchies and they're certainly they're they're ingrained in the institutions of those countries Uh, China is the most interesting simply because although there are descendants of the imperial family around uh, with the Chinese once a dynasty was deposed for good and all it was considered to have lost the mandate of heaven. Then they get a new dynasty. And very often the new dynasty would make the survivors of the old one nobility, which is why there's still descendants of the Ming dynasty around. Because when the, the Qing, the Manchu emperors, took over in 1644, uh, after all the fighting was done, there was still a branch of the old family left. And they made them dukes of something or other. And so they remained until the, the uh, Qing dynasty itself was overthrown in 1912. Um, Italy, of course, is a strange case because there are many kinds of Italian monarchists. Uh, you have those who would like to see, and, there, uh, and, and to make it even better, there's a succession dispute in case that wasn't enough. You have to have more. So there are two Savoy claimants for... Um, all of Italy, basically for the Italian kingdom that was produced in 1870. But the states that existed prior to 1860, the two Sicilies, again, dynastic dispute, two sets, uh, Modena, Parma, Sardinia itself, which is the House of Savoy, and then the Lombardo-Venetian kingdom, which was under the Austrian emperor. Oh, and the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, can't forget them. 
uh, there are claimants to all those thrones and adherents to all of those. Uh, and even even the, the supporters of a united Italian monarchy, uh, they're not just divided according to succession, but the kind of monarchy. You have Catholic Italian monarchists and sort of Masonic Italian monarchists who like the old liberal monarchy. So it's, it's, but that's how things are now. That's how things are under the current paradigm. If the current order of Europe should be disturbed terribly, then it's quite possible things will change. We'll see. If someone held a gun to your head and, and asked you to pick correctly the monarchy that was going to be restored, First, what would you pick? Yeah, most likely. Yeah. Uh, Central Europe. Hmm. The lands of the double eagle. Uh, simply because there are a lot of things mitigating in favor of it. Uh, mitigating in favor of Central European unity. But that unity in itself has to have a justification that transcends their intense nationalism, which brings us back both to the faith, which is stronger in Central Europe than elsewhere, and the fabulous House of Habsburg, which has always, always transcended nationality. Hmm. I mean, I, I doubt we'd ever see Austria-Hungary again as it was, but a Central European Federation with the head of the house as emperor and king of each of the countries. You know, Austria, Hungary, Czechia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Croatia, maybe Poland. Uh, what about Bohemia? That's Czechia. <laughs> I no see. longer the Czech Republic, incidentally. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that'll do it for this episode, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed it. Another pretty long one. We've it's close to three hours of content this week in total with the pre-show. So we're we're quite pleased. Uh, some very thought-provoking content, Charles. Yeah, and it's and it's been quite a uh, quite an uproarious time uh, for you guys, for us, for everybody. Uh, but stay sane inside insanity. And remember something terribly important. This is Monday. It's off the menu. And the soul you save. Maybe you're on. God bless all. See you next week. Thanks.